So uh, today I'll be uh, talking about uh, peripheral blood flow and how do we approach uh, a case, a sample that we have received, and how when to we, when we make a film and uh, when we make a film, how we see what we see and what we interpret from that. So that would mostly be about the approach and then uh, a little bit of RBC morphology because I don't think that the time will allow us to. Uh, uh, complete the entire thing, but uh, we will see how much we can cover. So, uh, like I said, it is a complex process, not a simple one. First is that you need to uh, identify the cell. That is the first and central skill that is required is assignment of the identities of the cells that are present and you classify. First you recognize and then you classify those cells in which categories they are falling. Okay. The next step is weighing. If uh, there are more than one cellular elements which are abnormal, then the different features, they must be prioritized relative to each other, okay? So uh, suppose I am uh, getting a, a microcytic picture, but that is a small one. And then there is another, uh, there's cystocytes and all things, they are there. And then that cystocytes, they take the priority over the microcytes. So that way, if we are seeing uh, more than one cellular element, then we have to uh, prioritize which one is uh, which and which one is more important. So based upon that, uh, these findings will make a decision, okay? So uh, this decision, again, is affected by uh, the level of the skill and the responsibility of the morphologist. The uh, more if uh, beginner, they are like you people, the people who have just now joined our institute. So those people, uh, obviously, they will have a lesser level of skill than the people who have been working in the labs for like so many years. So uh, based upon that, the diagnostic expectations, like I will not expect a first year to make a CMML diagnosis, but I would want a third year to be able to make the diagnosis. So again, the decision that we make based upon the recognition, classification, weighing, it also depends upon the level of the skill and the responsibility of the morphologist. So, and based upon all this, we make a final diagnosis. Again, that diagnosis is influenced strongly by the requirement to finish and move to the next case because in the labs, which are as busy as ours, receiving 1,500 to 2,000 samples a day, and then many of them uh, requiring uh, the examination of PBF. So again, then we don't have time. Obviously, the person who is seeing a slide for 10 minutes will be able to uh, diagnose it better, will be able to find some low level of morphological abnormalities rather than the person who is just putting a glance on the slide and then moving on to the next one. So all these things, they affect the final diagnosis that we make from the peripheral blood film. So... Um, when to make a smear. So we are in the era of uh, these advanced hematology analyzers, cell analyzers. So in like when we were doing our MD, the cell analyzers while but like mostly three parts in the labs, mostly the three part analyzers were available. So somebody was asking for a, a DLC, then we will need to make a slide. So you won't believe that, but in our days when I did my MD, uh, most in every single sample that we were receiving in the lab, a uh, smear was made for that. But in today's uh, times, when we are having the six parts and seven parts, which are giving us the information about uh, NRBCs and image organocytes, and then even, even suggesting whether the blasts are there or not, and all these things in these uh, times, uh, around two to 10% of the cases of CBC that we are receiving on average that will uh, require us to examine a smear. So what these uh, CBCs are, when these CBCs have abnormal CBC findings or with their critical values. Critical values are like the cutoffs, okay? Every lab decides their own critical values, whether uh, this range, if it goes below this or if it goes above this, I have to see the slide. So those are called critical values. So for every labs, they are different. There are some standard international things which are there, but then again, every lab has to decide what critical values uh, they are going to use to make a smear. So uh, there are several indications. The, broadly, they are classified into these uh, four categories. 
one is uh, qual quantitative abnormalities then in the cbc then there are qualitative abnormalities then if a clinician is requesting a pbf then we have to uh, make a smear and examine it and then again failed delta check delta check is something that uh, we are seeing uh, like consecutive cbcs we are seeing for a patient for a person and then if there is a significant change that change need not to fall in that uh, abnormal cbc values like uh, i will not see a slide in a case of uh, a person whose hemoglobin is uh, the analyzer giving as 11 gram per dl but if this patient has been uh, showing a hemoglobin of 14 gram per dl in the previous cbcs previous many cbcs then this three gram fall is significant for that patient and in that case i need to see the slide so again a failed delta check is an indication for uh, a PBF examination. So then the quantitative abnormalities, uh, like I said, these can be uh, considered uh, critical values for the labs. And uh, hemoglobin, when it is less than 7 gram per DL, or it is more than 2 grams per DL above the reference range, or the MCV for adults, again, when we go through the further slides, uh, next slides, and we'll realize, but this uh, MCV less than 75 femtoliter and more than 105 femtoliter sends true for adults, not for all populations. And then WBCs, if they're more less than 4,000 or more than 30,000 per microliter, so, and all these uh, ranges have been described mostly for the adult patient, and they uh, vary based upon the age. Sub like you can see here that lymphocytes in adult, if it is the absolute count of lymphocyte is coming as, as more than 5,000 per microliter, then you will make a smear, but it is okay for a, a child less than 12 years of age. So same, similarly, monocytes, if they are uh, more than 1,500 per microliter, then we have to see the slide in the adult, but less than 12 years, kid, up to 3000 monocytes absolute count is okay we don't need to see the slide and then in case of eosinophils more than 2000 absolute count in case of basophils the absolute count is more than 500 we need to see the slide and platelets as you all know we are making smears for a platelet count that is less than 1 lakh or if it is more than 10 lakhs so these are the quantitative abnormalities when they are present on the cbc we need to make a smear so coming to the next uh, indication that is qualitative abnormality. If we are seeing a neonatal sample, that is the uh, first month of life, the first sample, if we are receiving, the, we have to see that. We have to make the slide for that. And then if the machine is not giving the differential completely or no differential at all, then obviously we will have to see the slide. And if the clinician is suspecting uh, infectious diseases like malaria or filariasis, then obviously the analyzer cannot diagnose that. We need to see the slide. Again, analyzer, if it is detecting any abnormal population, if there are any flags in case of RBCs, if there are NRBC flags, there are red cell fragments flags, or if there is a flag for dimorphic population, that, then we need to see the slide. In WBCs, immature granulocytes, abnormal lymphocytes, blast. In case of platelets, if it is showing clumps or uh, MPV, mean platelet volume flag, if they are showing. So all these are the indications when uh, we need to uh, see the slide. So I will not go into the detail of this, that how do you make a smear because uh, it's a lengthy topic in itself, but I will just quickly cover what is the most important, what are the most important things that you need to remember how to make about how to make a smear. So the sample should be uh, taken in dipotassium EDTA anticoagulant and the smear should be ideally made within 12 hours of collection when the sample is stored at four to eight degrees Celsius temperature. Okay, so then ideal smear that will have one, a large area of that is one cell layer thick because we need to examine the smear. The final assessment that we are doing of the morphology we are doing in the area, which is one cell layer thick. So the ideal smear should have a large area, which is one cell layer thick, okay? Then third, second most important point is that often people uh, ignore it and that will result in a badly made slide and that will uh, result in uh, difficulty in assessing the morphology. So that we are often facing in the cases of a neonatal sample where the hemoglobin is like 16, 19, reaching up to 21 and 23, then we face this problem if we are following the same amount of blood and same amount of angle that is uh, classically told to you that, okay, 20 to 30 degree angle that you have to keep. If you keep following that for this every single sample, then the smear quality will be affected. So the amount of blood that we deposit on the slide and the angle of the spreader that we use, it should be adjusted 
depending upon the viscosity of the blood and the hematocrit of the blood. So suppose if the viscosity is more and hematocrit is more like in the case of a newborn sample, then you need to put a smaller drop of the, on the slide before you spread it. And then you have to keep the angle lower than what you usually keep. So that will uh, lead to a uh, you, you will get a thinner slide with that. So that is the way how you make a thinner slide. So in case of uh, more viscosity and more hematocrit, you need a thinner slide. And then you have to reduce the amount of blood and you have to reduce the angle. And while in case of anemia, where the viscosity is low, the hematocrit is very low, you have to put a bigger dot and then you have to increase the angle of the spreader. Otherwise, it will just become very difficult to interpret the morphology that we struggle often with the neonates uh, samples. Okay, then again, what is very important is that if you fix the slide immediately with methanol after proper drying, the after proper drying is very important. And with, we don't need to uh, fix it separately from the methanol because we are using uh, Leishman stains in our lab and the Leishman itself is uh, made in methanol. So that will fix the slide. But before we put the stain on the slide, we need to make sure that the slide is properly dried. Why I am stressing on that? We will just come to those uh, artifacts and then I'll tell you why it is important to dry the slide completely before you stain it. Okay, so the slides that should not be left unfixed beyond a few hours, morphology will be affected. Suppose you are not staining the slide today, then in that case, you have to fix the slide in the methanol and then only you can keep it. Otherwise your morphology will be ruined when you next go back to uh, next day or day after tomorrow and stain it. Then the morphology will not be the same that you are seeing today. And then stain that we are using, our Romanovsky stain, we are using our Leishman stain in our labs. Oh, so they will stain the nuclei blue and hemoglobin and eosin granule, eosinophil granules as red and orange. So there are several uh, things which can cause uh, abnormal staining patterns. One is azure B eosin ratio. That is not an issue because most of the times uh, we are using a powdered uh, dyes. Ray. So we are just receiving a ready-made powder of Leishman stain. So that stay ratio is not an issue. And then again, the pH of the buffer. So pH, ideal pH of the buffer is 6.8. If pH is lower than that, then your WBC will not stain. They will just look like halos. And if the pH is way too high, then your RBC will become very, very dark and the WBCs will be overstained. So the pH of the buffer should be in the range. So it is 6.8, ideal pH is 6.8. Then the timing of the staining again, uh, you have to determine the time in how much time you are putting for the staining and then age of the stain as the stain go, goes older older it starts becoming acidic so in that case that will uh, affect the quality of stains and then contaminants like water and all they will also affect the staining quality so all these things you have to keep in mind before you are making a smear before you are staining it and fixing it and all So uh, this slide just shows a few uh, peripheral smears which have been made. So the first smear that you are seeing, it is the ideal smear, okay? It is tongue shaped and it has a large area which is a single cell layer. So it is an ideal smear, it is a well-made smear. In the second one, these dots that you are seeing, these are uh, because of uh, dust particles on the slide. So this slide was not properly cleaned. And in this third one, see, this part is uh, really thick. And here you are seeing a very, very thin part of the smear. The reason is the pressure that has been applied to the spreader was inconsistent. And that has led, led to the formation of uh, these graded kind of uh, spread of the smear. In this, this one, the spreader edge was uneven. The spreader edge should be smooth. And uh, this last one is uh, made on a very, very greasy slide. So you will see this kind of vacuoles in the bone marrow smear. So, because the fat is there in the bone marrow. So uh, these greasy slides, they need to be cleaned before you uh, make a smear. So all these things you have to keep in mind because if your slide preparation is faulty, then no matter how well you are morphologist you are, you will struggle with the diagnosis. So before you start looking at the slide, okay? So you have seen that your slide has been made okay, the staining is fine, everything is there. Then the most important thing before you start looking, before you put the slide on your under your microscope is 
check the identification information on the slide. I cannot emphasize it enough that you have to check the identification on the requisition form, on the CBC that you have received, and on the slide that you have received. It is very important that you see that all these three, three things belong to the same patient because one wrong identification will lead to two wrong reports. So that's why it is very important that before you start seeing the slide, because nothing else matters if you are identifying the uh, slide incorrectly. So then after that, once you have confirmed that, yes, the slide and the uh, CBC and the request form belongs to the same patient, then you review the CBC report. In the CBC, you see the what the indices are saying, if there are any flags, because it is important you see what abnormalities are there that you have to focus on. So that's why you assess the indices, any flags if they are there. And I would strongly recommend that you see the histograms and you see the scatter plots because they also give a lot of information. So Dr. Viba will be covering all these things in the next session. So uh, then we will talk more about these, but it is very important that you uh, look, have a good look at the scatter plots and the histograms also other than the CBC values that you are getting. After that, the clinical history, although we uh, keep saying that the clinicians are not providing the history, it is very important. Yes, it is very important in hematology diagnosis to have a clinical history, but you should review the film before you look at the clinical history. Why I am saying this? Because it will just induce a bias you will start looking for the things that the history is suggesting. So you should not look at the clinical history before you at least once have a just quick scanning of the slide, you should not look at the history. Because if you see, you will not be able to look at the slide objectively. But once you have reviewed the slide, it is very important that you look at the clinical history. Why it is important? Because it will ensure that you haven't missed the low level change that it's pertinent to the case. Like if it, the clinician is suspecting a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, then just have a quick scan if you have missed any schistocytes which are there. If the clinician is suspecting there is malaria, then you just quickly scan it again so that you see if some low level of parasitemia that you might have missed. So all these things, that's why never look at the history before you review the slide once but always look at the history once you have reviewed and it, the slide so that you can just uh, put the missing links in between and make a final diagnosis. So once you have done all it, of this, you have put the slide on the microscope, then you need to know what to look for and where. First, just examine the slide microscopically because that will tell you, like I said, uh, show that previous slide in the spreading quality and all, that will tell you about the spreading and staining quality, the microscopically. Then suppose some examples are there. If the slide is showing increased blue coloration, this might be uh, because of uh, multiple myeloma or any uh, inflammatory condition when the globulins, immunoglobulins are increased. Uh, I'm getting this uh, message. So the, our meeting might end in like next two, three minutes. So I will just uh, resend the link and we can just connect, okay? So uh, microscopically, we will uh, look at a blue coloration, as I said. This is just one example. So that hypergamma globulinemia. And then uh, there are some conditions where there is gross ab abnormal clumping, like in uh, cold agglutinin disease, you can find gross RB RBC agglutination on the, which is visible macroscopically or cryoglobulins or platelet clumps or clumps of tumor cells, all these things, they can be sometimes uh, seen or identified macroscopically also. So uh, these are the smears. This uh, first uh, smear is made from a patient of multiple myeloma. And you can see the this as compared to this normal slide, it is intensely blue. So again, this suggests uh, that that might be you might be dealing with a condition where uh, there is increased high molecular proteins in the uh, plasma. So the second one is showing a case of a cold agglutinin disease. The first slide has been made at room temperature. You can see a lot of agglutinates in this. 
But the second slide, this temple was warmed at 37 degrees Celsius. The, probably the slide was also warmed at 37 degrees Celsius and then the smear was made. So it, it looks perfectly normal. But when it was made at room temperature, you can see uh, a lot of agglutinates in this. This third image is from a multiple myeloma patient. And uh, you can see these cryoglobulin precipitates at the end of the slide. And the fourth one, the people who have been posted in cytology, they can easily identify these uh, dark blue, uh, these aggregates, these are of uh, tumor cells. So, uh, this was about the macroscopic examination of the slide. Once you have put the slide on the microscope, first put a thin layer of thin layer of oil on the slide or put a cover slip on that because that will help you examine it better because uh, when we are not putting any oil or when we are not applying any cover slip, then there will be some uh, refractile uh, artifact from the RBC. So in order to avoid that, just remember to make a, just a thin film on the slide, because if you make a thick film, that will just ruin your 40x lens. So uh, just make a thin fl film and then quick scan at the low power. So at low power, what we can identify if there is very high or very low count, if there is any abnormal RBC arrangement, if there is a dual population like a microcytic or macrocytic or microcytic or normocytic the same way, uh, if there is any dual population, we can better identify at 10X because we are seeing more number of cells there. If there are any platelet clumps, if there are any fibrin stents, they will suggest that the sample was partially clotted. If there are any circulating malignant cells that I, like I showed in the slide before that uh, they were visible grossly, but you can then find them on tail also. And then large parasites like filaria. If you are not examining the slide at 10X, you might miss them. So first, when you are starting to see the slide, quickly examine it at 10X and see, and this is also important that uh, you examine the 10x because based upon that you will look for the area where the rbcs are evenly spread the wbcs and platelets are also evenly spread and you will select that area for further examination at 40x so the head end of the slide because uh, as i said uh, uh, peripheral blood smear has three ends one is head then body and tail so the head end it is too thick for morphological use. Here the, you can see the RBCs are overlapping. There's a lot of Brule formation and the WBCs, they appear contracted and dark. Look at this neutrophil. It is looking like almost the same size of these RBCs. So these, they look contracted and dark. You cannot examine the morphology here. So this is not for morphological use, but this area can be used for malaria parasite screening because this will act as a thick smear that we make for mal malaria diagnosis. And obviously this will not be, uh, you will not be able to diagnose the species here, but you can at least find. So in the case of a suspected malaria, you can just quickly look, go and look at the head end of the slide and see if there are any parasites there. And then you can just go to the body and tail and you will find and decide which species it is. So at the tail end, the RBCs, again, it is not uh, good for morphological examination because the RBCs, they are in chains here, you can see, and they will lack central pillow. They will all look like spherocytes, okay? But they are not actually spherocytes. So never identify a cell as spherocyte or never diagnose a case as spherocytosis by looking at the tail end of the slide. But again, this tail end can be used for uh, identifying your finding platelet clumps if there are any large platelets, any circulating tumor cells or large parasites, as I already said, because in the tail and edges, there will be a lot of uh, drying effect artifact also. So I would say that don't examine your uh, WBCs also there because that will just lead to an onus diagnosis. Many a times lymphocytes start looking like blasts there. So it's not wise to uh, look at the WBC is also there at the tail end and comment on them. Then the body, body, the, not the entire body of this uh, film, choose a part of the body where RBCs are close to each other, like this one, but not touching. And most important thing is they have central pallor. Because if they are showing central pallor, that means you are in reasonably good area because towards the tail end or the central pallor will be missing. So this area, is the best area for morphological assessment. So you go to the slide, you look at the 10X, and then you just move towards the body and you find the area like this, and then you focus the slide on 40X and examine it further. 
So uh, coming to the microscopy, before I start actually discussing the uh, morphological changes, it is very important that you identify the artifacts. What are the storage induced changes and what are other artifacts that can be there that can confuse you, that can make you misdiagnose the case. Okay, so prolonged story, storage can cause several changes in all cell lineages, okay? It can, uh, in the RBCs, it will lead to loss of central pallor. That will, they will, all the RBCs will, they, they will start looking like uh, spherocytes. There will be crenation of the RBCs that is called econocytic changes. And the neutrophils, they will also de start showing degenerative changes. So, okay, so this is one interesting thing that I have asked many of the postgraduates to identify this cell. I'll show it in the next slide. The degenerated neutrophil that is showing an apoptotic nucleus as a single nuclear mass. Most of them, they have diagnosed it as NRBC because of the apoptotic dark single round nucleus. Okay, so uh, again, Looking at the cytoplasm is the key here. If you are looking at just at the nucleus, you might misdiagnose it as an RBC, but if you are looking the, at the cell as a whole, you will never call it an NRBC. Okay. So then uh, this degenerative changes, they will uh, lead to a decreased neutrophil count. And then the, our CBC will show uh, pseudoneutropenia. The lymphocytes, they will start showing extensive nuclear lobulation. Excess of EDTA that can cause also can cause. Oh, I would uh, like to interrupt. Uh, uh, Reina, can I? Yes, sure, sure. So, students, uh, as Dr. Prerna is very well uh, telling you all the aspects, and it, these are the practical aspects. One more thing comes to you when there is prolonged storage. So, usually, what happens uh, in the pediatric cases? What they do is, as a child is uh, like inside, like uh, the fish child is admitted. The sisters usually what they do, do is they take out two, three samples and keep them in fridge and then rest like uh, they send, uh, gradually they start sending those samples. So sometimes what happens in children, you tend to fall in a ditch like, okay, I'm finding these abnormalities, which Dr. Prerna has very well told, but you should be very cautious looking at the cells, ke, are they showing degenerative changes? Otherwise, as she's saying, these changes will be so obvious and you will get a hair where uh, type of uh, differentiation or you will do a DLC, which is very wrong. So I have been in a ditch, like I diagnosed a, a Pelger with anomaly in a, a small child. And later on, when repeatedly I asked for the smears, like the day one, day two, day three, then we came to know these are the storage artifacts. So especially in pediatric cases, please look into the storage artifacts because usually the sisters give the sample like the old samples they send to the lab. So as I was saying, uh, excess EDTA that can also uh, cause changes similar to the prolonged storage and also it accelerates the development of storage changes. As uh, Dr. Vibha is saying, this excess EDTA is a common problem in the pediatric samples because they take less sample and the tube is of two for a two ml sample, they are taking one ml sample and then again, it will accelerate the development of those storage changes. Okay, so this is the uh, degenerated neutrophil I was talking about. So yes, the nucleus look like that of an NRBC, but it is an apoptotic nucleus. But when you look at the cytoplasm, it is, uh, of the same color as this, uh, again, myeloid precursor. And there are some granules also. If so, if you look at the cytoplasmic uh, details, uh, it is uh, difficult to call it uh, an NRBC. So whenever you are seeing some storage related artifacts, then uh, if you are finding uh, this kind of cells, which you will, please don't call them NRBCs. And in these RBCs, you are seeing these uh, echinocytic changes. These all are crenated RBCs. Again, a storage induced artifact in RBCs. And uh, this, believe it or not, it is a lymphocyte, which is showing extensive lobulation of the nucleus. Again, you are seeing these uh, crenation in these RBCs. So these all are storage induced changes, and you need to keep that in mind when you are examining this slide. Sometimes these are so extensive that you uh, just don't comment on uh, the smears like these, just ask for a fresh sample and don't comment because in this kind of smears, you are bound to make mistakes like uh, Dr. Vibha pointed out. You are bound to make mistakes in these smears. So the another artifact that is very important that and that we see very, very often in our uh, slides, 
that is hydration artifact hydration artifact is uh, just hydration that means the uh, your smear is hydrated the water is there on that smear so there are many causes for that one is uh, inadequate drying of the film prior to the fixation so your technician is a little impatient uh, they are just putting the stain on the slide before the slide is properly dried so then that will induce the hydration artifact another the methanol is because it is hygroscopic so if you are lose uh, leaving that uh, staining stain bottle uh, the cap of the stain bottle a little loose then the methanol that is present in that uh, stain that will absorb the water from the surrounding and the water content of the methanol will increase and that will lead to the uh, generation of this hydration artifact and then next is uh, increased humidity in the environment like in the ra rainy season the humidity is more then you have to actually increase the drying time if we are using uh, like six seven ten minutes of the drying time in uh, summers then in the uh, this humid environments in the rainy season maybe we need 20 minutes for that or maybe we need to use a dryer for that or an incubator for that purpose but we need to dry the slides because if the hydration artifact is present it precludes a pop proper morphological assessment of the rbcs you cannot comment upon that and these changes they keep on increasing uh, with the degree of the hydration artifact with the degree of water that is present on the slide so this is a, a very very beautiful picture from the desi and it is just showing uh, the these four images first image in which the there is one percent water in the stain methanol in second, there is 3% water. Fourth, there is 4% 4 4 water. In the third one, there is 10% of the water in the... So you can compare this There is this 1% water. The cells are like beautifully fixed. You can very well tell that, okay, these are uh, nomocytic cells and all. But here, it is impossible to tell. It is impossible to comment on the RBC morphology in this one. And here, again, there are some cells which are showing this punched out artifact, but then there are some which are fine. So again, this can also be commented upon. You have to find an area and where you can comment on this. Again, with 4% water, the more and more cells start showing these punched out uh, changes, holes like things. These are again hydration artifact. And many times the people who have just started seeing slides, they start calling them hypochromic cells, which they are not. Like in this cell, you are seeing the hypochromasia is definitely more than the central one third but it is not a hypochromic cell that I can tell you. So uh, this was uh, the high water that is present and that was present in the methanol. Again, this smear, these are looking like the leucine crystals in the urine, but they are RBCs. And because the smear was not properly dried, they, they are looking like this. Several vacuoles of water are there in these RBCs or it is very important that you are aware of this change and not call it some clinical process, not confuse it with some clinical process. This smear was, can you see it now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, yeah, we were continuing with hydration artifact. The first image that I showed was the methanol, water content in methanol. The second image that I'm showing is uh, because of the poor drying of the smear. Again, this image, it is important. You see there are uh, many like the eccentric, uh, these vacuoles, they are showing some black ring around them. Sometimes it's a very higher magnification, but when you are seeing it at a lower magnification, you may confuse them as uh, malaria rings, ring forms of the malaria, okay? And when they are in the center, like I said, they can confuse you with uh, artifactual hypochromasia, okay? It is not hypochromic, these are not, uh, malaria rings, you should be aware of this artifact and what changes it can cause. Uh, this is a smear made from a sample that has been uh, accidentally heated. So heating of a sample like uh, in our, uh, in, this, in summers when an attendant is running here and there and looking for where to submit the sample and the temperature is like reaching 50 degrees Celsius at that time, the RBCs they go under undergo these extensive fragmentation. Okay, so the smear will look like this. There is a hereditary condition also that is called hereditary pyropoikilocytosis, but it is not that. It is just accidental heating of the specimen. So you need to be aware of this. That if sample is accidentally heated, you will find lots and lots of fragments in that. 
So, okay, after all this, you have seen the CBC, you have seen the microscopic appearance, you have seen that okay, there are no storage artifacts, nothing is there. Once you have decided, okay, this smear is proper for evaluation, what do you do next? So you first compare the film's appearance with the CBC, okay? See if the WBC count, the hemoglobin, that MCV and the platelet count that you are seeing in the film is matching with that of the CBC. Because if it is not, you first inspect the blood sample if there is a clot or not, because the presence of a clot can cause reduction in WBC count and platelet count and can falsely increase MCV. Hemoglobin will be fine, but first inspect the blood sample if there is any inconsistency. If the blood sample is fine, first you repeat the CBC. And again, if the CBC repeat CBC is matching with that of your previous one, then you need to repeat the film because that just means that it might be from two different phases. So the common causes of inconsistency are, like I said, a sample that has been poorly mixed, which has resulted in partial clotting of the sample. Then again, in neonates, the sample that often we receive is too small a sample volume. In that case, the instrument, the analyzer will not have enough volume to aspirate then again, it will lead to the uh, discrepancy between the CBC and what you are seeing on the film. And the common cause that we are seeing often is uh, a bl blood film and CBC that has been derived from different samples. So you need to exclude all these things when you are seeing any discrepancy between the CBC and the peripheral blood film. Once you have excluded all this, then what it can be? It can be that the sample itself is abnormal. If there is hyperlipidemia, in hyperlipidemia cases, we have seen a case that uh, the lipid content was so, so high that when we centrifuged the sample, the plasma was literally looking like milk. So in these cases, uh, the hemoglobin will be very high and the hemoglobin estimation, because it is overly estimated, your all RBC indices that has been calculated, those are which are the calculated parameters, all of them will be wrongly calculated, okay? So in these hyperlipidemia, how will you uh, think that, okay, hyperlipidemia might be there? You are seeing the outlines of all these cells, they have become fuzzy. In the neutrophils also, also, you cannot tell the outline. So uh, the hyperlipidemia samples, they will look like this, or it could be cold agglutinin disease. In that case, your MCV will be overestimated, and then again, rest of your indices will be affected by that. So these are RBC agglutinates. So all these things, once you have uh, eliminated all the errors, possible technical errors, then you have to look at the smear and see if the sample might also be abnormal.